This is the story of a man named Jim Boylan. Jim Boylan worked for an NBA team in a big city called Chicago. This team was called the Chicago Bulls and he was their head coach. Jim Boylan's job was simple. He needed to set the Bulls up for success and further develop the young core of players on his team. Unfortunately for Jim, only one single week after he landed his new head coaching job, there was already a lot of criticism being directed his way and by the season's end, he had managed to turn the entire Chicago Bulls fan base against him. You're a clown! A clown, buddy! What went wrong exactly? Is Jim to blame for his team's lack of success? And is that head actually just one giant egg with the face painted on? All of that and more will be answered in the story of Jim Boylan and the Chicago Bulls. After a 5-19 start to the season and with the team on a six-game losing streak, Fred Hoiberg's three-year-long tenure as head coach of the Chicago Bulls came to an unceremonious end as he was fired. His replacement was the team's previous assistant head coach, Jim Boylan. In a perfect world, and no doubt what Bulls management were hoping for with this decision, was that Boylan, after becoming head coach, would be the difference maker for this young Bulls team in helping to turn their season around. While Hoiberg had always coached with a relatively mild-mannered, relaxed and soft demeanour, Boylan was the complete opposite. He was loud, energetic and aggressive, and was seen as a hard-nosed, no-bullshit coach that could bring a much-needed culture change to this team and instill a winning mentality in this young core. And although we now know that Boylan may not have been the answer the Bulls were looking for, I mean he turned out to be the worst head coach in the league, at the time of his promotion at least, it wasn't crazy at all to have faith in Boylan's ability to lead this Bulls team to success. Before snagging this new head coaching gig, Jimbo's resume looked pretty good. Jim already had over 20 years experience of assistant coaching in the NBA. Some of the teams that he had been an assistant coach to included the 1994 and 1995 Houston Rockets and the 2014 San Antonio Spurs. As an assistant coach, this dude was part of multiple championship teams and has three NBA championship rings as a result. Furthermore, his two years working in San Antonio meant he was under the tutelage of one of the greatest coaches in NBA history in Greg Popovich. That alone is an exciting prospect when the league has seen former assistant coaches under Pop blossom into some of the best head coaches in the league once they got a head coaching job, e.g. Mike Budenholzer. On paper at least, with all this experience under his belt, Boylan's promotion to head coach looked like an easy choice to make, and optimism for the success of this move appeared to be very justified. Jim Boylan, this Jim Boylan, was an assistant in San Antonio, was a head coach in college. This is his chance to, to try to have a young, talented group and grow with them. He's a really good coach. And, you know, he was with Greg Popovich in uh, San Antonio and then came as the associate head coach in Chicago. He's a, a coach that has paid his dues in this league. He has been an assistant for some of the best coaches in the league. He has a passion and, a, and an energy to him that I think our players will respond to. And I think he'll be able to, to take his personality and get these guys to, to buy into what, he, what he's doing. You know, we, we believe Jim will be able to affect change uh, hopefully quickly. Although not a Bulls fan myself, I too was keenly following this coaching change. Prior to the 2019 season starting, I had so much misguided confidence in the Chicago Bulls to not be total dog shit that I went ahead and placed a $20 bet on them to win over 28 games. As one might expect, I was a little concerned about my 20 bucks when the Bulls started the season all 5 and 17, and the prospect of them winning at least 29 games wasn't looking too hot. So when Hoiberg got the axe and Boiling became the new head coach, I was excited by this move and was hopeful in his ability to turn the bull season around and help me win my $20 back. 10 days later, with the Bulls going 1-6 and six in that stretch, including the biggest defeat in Bulls history when they lost by 56 points to the Celtics, my hopes for Chicago to have a 29-win season had been crushed to dust and dissipated into nothing. And I had accepted the fact that my $20 was now, sadly, gone forever. It was also around this time that the conversations about Boylan's incompetence as head coach began brewing. Pro tip, you never want the word mutiny in the headlines about your franchise. Jim Boylan is burning down the Chicago Bulls, not unlike the way he torched the Utes. It could all be a disaster and Chicago could be looking for another new coach. The Jim Boylan era is off to a rough start for the Bulls as <laughs> players threaten to boycott practice. It just sure feels like they don't respect their coach already. And that's how you start in week one. The worst of the year potential for the Chicago sure. Bulls. I think it's in play. Mind you, this is only week one, and as I'm sure everybody watching knows, that perception of Jim Boylan did not improve. No, it, um, it got much worse. You're a clown! Any smart person would fire you! You're a clown! A clown, 
everybody. Jimmy, you're a disgrace for the city. On March 10, 2020, a day before the NBA 2020 season would be suspended after Rudy Gobert touched some microphones, Jim Boylan would coach his final game of the regular 2020 season. Although he's probably going to hang around as head coach for at least the next couple months due to the NBA's completely idiotic idea of hosting a second bubble in Chicago for all the shit teams that nobody wants to watch, in all likelihood, Jimbo won't be returning as the Bulls head coach in 2021. Thus, discounting whatever may or may not happen in the planned Chicago bubble later this year, the Bulls ended up with 22 wins for the shortened season, making Boylan's total record with the Bulls 39-84, and 84, a winning percentage of 31% that equates to 25 wins over an 82-game season. That winning percentage was even worse than the last Jim Boylan to coach the Chicago Bulls, and he only lasted 56 games. Despite boasting a career of over 30 years coaching a basketball team in some capacity, and despite his success in becoming the head coach of an NBA team, a position that only 30 people in the entire world can ever hold at one time, Jim Boylan suffered from a very significant coaching problem that there was no easy fix to. As it pertains to coaching an NBA team, Jim Boylan is a complete and utter incompetent buffoon. Throughout his two seasons as a Bulls head coach, Boylan proved time and time again that he seriously didn't know what in the fuck he was doing and lacked any semblance of self-awareness as to how so many of his actions as head coach were to the absolute detriment of his team's success. Through his coaching decisions and statements to the media, Jimbo would continually display his supreme lack of basketball IQ and knowledge to the world, while simultaneously, he would cement himself as the unanimous worst head coach in the whole league. So what actually makes Boylan such a bad coach you might be wondering? We get that he sucks and he's a fuckhead, but what does that actually look like in practice? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Here's a little rundown of everything Jim Boylan did wrong as a Chicago Bulls head coach. Over the past two seasons, Boylan's timeouts have become a thing of infamy. It's almost like, is he doing a bit? Like, why is he still, do this is like, it's like an avant-garde art project going on. First off, he has this very annoying propensity for calling a lot of completely unnecessary and pointless late game timeouts. These timeouts include when the Bulls were down 10 points with 30 seconds left, down 20 with a minute and a half left, and down as much as 25 with only a minute left. These useless timeouts tend to piss just about everybody off, including the game's broadcasters. And a timeout here from Jim Boylan. What are you doing? I've known Jim a lot. Like, what, seriously, like, what strategy are you talking? It's Down a 25 point blowout. There's a minute four left. It's Super Bowl Sunday. I want to get out of here. <laughs> Come on. Really? Do you really need to run yeah, a play down here? 25. Here we the fans. And Ben Simmons don't play well. They you changed know. the call, by the way, to Bulls ball. Now the crowd is booing Jim Boylan because he called timeout after the huddle for the replay. And probably most importantly, his own players. Put that uniform on, you still gotta come out and perform. And you play with it, play with a chip with your just in a game that's gone back and forth. The biggest lead by the Bulls was 17, the biggest lead by Phoenix. Furthermore, he'll happily call timeout when one of his players is about to score a layup. <laughs> by Jim Boylan, they would have, the Bulls would have scored and Sato's, oh my not, goodness. Sato's not happy about that That's timeout. That's a layup. Wow. Oh my goodness. Oh. But then when one of his players gets injured mid-game, instead of doing what every coach would do if one of their players gets injured, which is to call a timeout and stop the play, he suddenly got very stingy with his timeouts and refused to call one. Instead, he waited for the opposing team's coach to call one for him. What a jackass. Very explosive leaper. And Vinny Smith just had a great touch pass. And Lucas driving and doesn't score. Powell with the putback. It's a player down. I think it's Gafford, as a matter of fact, who is yeah, down right sense. now for Chicago. I know Rick's saying they can't sub, but I also think that Rick was kind of sticking up. He's saying, like, the kid's hurt. But it is up to the Bulls to stop the clock. I mean, in fact, I'm still not 100% sure I know what I just witnessed. In the NBA, a lot of the time, one of the saving graces for bad coaches is that they have a positive relationship with their players. Think of coaches like Ty Lu or Jason Kidd. Thus, this just makes Boylan that much more special. Not only is he bad at day-to-day -day coaching, he also lacks camaraderie and a positive relationship with the players on his team. The consistent stream of reports from the Bulls locker room during Boylan's reign as head coach, be that from week one to his final days as head coach, 
all indicate that his player relationships varied from unpleasant at best to antagonistic at worst. I guess it probably wasn't a sign of good things to come when only six days into his head coaching career, the majority of the Bulls team agreed to mutiny against Boylan and not come to a scheduled practice. Then a day later, it became evident that the Bulls players had even complained to the Players Association about Boylan for his excessive practices. Now, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say that this kind of disconnect between a coach and his team probably isn't particularly conducive for team chemistry or morale. Larry Markkinen has been clearly frustrated with Boylan for a very long time because of how Boylan used him on offense. After joining the team, Thaddeus Young quickly became upset with how he was being used after being pitched something different in free agency. Thomas Sadoransky has expressed confusion over Boylan's rotations, and then there's also this video here of Wendell Carter Jr. laughing when a fan yells, fire Boylan. So far this year, what do you think, what was that? I still haven't even touched on his relationship with his team's best player yet, Zach Levine. Despite his best efforts, Boylan never was particularly successful in getting Levine to buy into his game plan. Apparently, the only way for Boylan to actually get through to Zach is by pulling him out of the game when he doesn't like what he's seeing, which is something he did after Zach had played less than three and a half minutes against the Heat in November. It's uh, Zach Levine who went out early after just three minutes. I'm sure you can imagine how happy Levine was with that move. And I've got pulled early before by him. I guess that's just his thing to do. I thought I did. You know, I thought I was trying to do my job out there. So. Like I said, I can't do anything about that. I just gotta control what I can control. Although Levine's performance in the Bulls' next game against Charlotte would be the best one of his entire career. Chicago's got it! Oh no! You're kidding! Boylan's inability to get through to his best player outside of benching him for the entire game is certainly no small issue. And then you have the examples of Levine effectively cursing Boylan in game. The young and four. The biggest lead by the Bulls was 17, the biggest lead by Phoenix. And also Zach calling Boylan's coaching style a dictatorship. I just don't think these two were ever besties. We're talking about practice, man. We're talking about practice. We're talking about practice. We're talking about practice, man. Like many of his coaching problems, getting practice right has been an issue for Boylan since day one. Jimbo obviously believes very much in traditional old school basketball coaching. And part of that thinking includes building one's character off the court, even if that means potentially less success on the court in the short term. Thus, at least in his view, a big part of building that character is by running frequent, heavy and exhausting practices that really push his players to the limit. The issue with this line of thinking is that while those kind of practices might work for a high school or college team, running conditioning drills for an NBA team, a team of adults playing in the number one professional basketball league in the world, really only helps exhaust a team as opposed to improving it. But where practices like these actually become much more problematic is when they're occurring in the middle of an 82 game regular season. Although shootarounds during the season are perfectly normal, full-blown practices filled with sprints and push-ups like the ones Boylan runs are not so common, but are much more of a rarity than anything. With an 82-game schedule to play through, a schedule many people believe is already too intense and unnecessarily causes injuries, and all the vigorous travel that meeting such a schedule entails, most NBA coaches do not put their teams through unnecessary practices throughout the regular season. Jim Boylan, obviously, is not most NBA coaches, and in his first week as head coach, he ran intense practices on each day leading up to a back-to-back -back against the Thunder and Celtics starting on Friday. What this meant for the Bulls players and their two-day break before a back-to-back -back against two playoff teams, instead of spending those days resting and conserving their energy, they were in the gym running up and down the court. The result was that in the second game of the back-to-back -back against the Celtics, with obviously no energy left in the tank, the Bulls suffered their worst defeat in franchise history after losing by 56 points. This loss also tied the second worst all-time loss for an NBA team on their home floor. Boylan obviously didn't see an issue with the practices he had held thus far and scheduled yet another practice for his exhausted team on the morning after the back-to-back, -back, which was still only seven days into Boylan's head coaching career, mind you, that the team decided they were fed up with all the fucking practices and prepared to mutiny, whilst also complaining to the Players Association. Basically, through his practices, Boylan had managed to lose the confidence and respect of his team within one week in the job. No team in the NBA basically practices or even has a shoot around after a back-to-back, -back, right. no matter what. Jimbo's intense practices full of push-ups, sprints and conditioning drills would become something of a staple for his time as head coach, despite the fact that frequent heavy practices probably weren't the most optimal thing for a team riddled with injuries like the Bulls always were. But anyway, Oh, and as further proof that he treats his team like a bunch of high schoolers, Jimbo had a custom clock built and installed at the Bulls practice facility where he asked his players to punch actual time cards for when they entered and left practice. This little routine really only helped fuel further embarrassment for the Bulls and led to a bountiful amount of mockery on social media and the internet. There is no way I'm coming in 
making millions of dollars and you about to have me punch a clock. Man, get the hell out of here. I ain't punching no uh, clock. It's not high school. It's no, not it's college. Not and school. that has He's been part of the man. adjustment. This is a grown man league. Boylan's rotations are, in a word, puzzling. They are consistently inconsistent and tend to lack much sense from a coaching point of view. Jimbo's rotations aren't just confusing NBA fans, but even his own players. This is how Thomas Sadoransky feels about Boylan's substitutions. I don't see into it either. It's frustrating. It's difficult to comprehend. First off, Jim has always had an issue with staggering Levine and Markinen's minutes, as in he never did it nearly enough. Zach is obviously the better offensive player than Larry, so of course when they're sharing the court, the offense will be mainly running through him. Now that's great and all when helping Zach grow as a player, but just not so much for poor old Larry. Markinen needs and deserves much more opportunities to be the number one option on the floor for greater stretches of time if the Bulls want to further develop his offensive skill set and repertoire. But that simply cannot happen when Boylan is constantly subbing him off the court at the same time as Levine. Although injuries obviously play a significant factor, so do Boylan's inept coaching decisions, which has seen Lowry regress in nearly every statistical category from the 2019 season. In his words, Boylan has I got 15 guys to develop. Okay then, Boylan has 15 guys to develop. Makes sense, I guess. Who cares if a great portion of those guys will be in the G League or a completely different team next year? Who cares if you're giving extra minutes to the third stringers at the expense of further development for players like Markkinen and Kobe White? It's not like the latter is your franchise's future or anything. This relates to another issue with Boylan's rotations, which is how he's shown a knack for subbing the entire starting lineup out of the game. Most NBA head coaches, as in every single other head coach in the league, will generally make sure to always have at least one starter on the floor at a time, if the game isn't in garbage time of course. Boylan is a little different in this regard. Of course, we all know that he has 50 guys to develop, and thus, it was commonplace to see all five Bulls starters on the bench. Although the public scrutiny of his rotations may have eventually found a way into his egg-headed skull, and he would shorten his team's rotations, this definitely wasn't true at the start of his head coaching tenure. In his third game as head coach, in that good old 56-point loss to the Celtics that I keep referring to, Boylan subbed the entire starting lineup out together not just once, but twice. It's one thing to do it in the first quarter. They were down 13-0. Yeah, you see that. All right, get these starters out maybe the, the bench gives us something but then it happened again in the second half after it was like a five to three run from the Celtics and Boylan did that again yeah. that is really really strange and unheard of here's how Zach Levine felt about his new coach's substitutions you don't see five man substitutions happen a lot in the league so no you don't <laughs> Jim Boylan's underuse of Larry Markkinen on offense is criminal. I did just mention how his inept rotations are hurting Markkinen's development as a player, but this issue really does deserve its own section. Larry is a 23-year-old 7-footer that averaged 18-9 and in his second season, whilst shooting 36% from three on over six attempts a game. This man is a big part of the Bulls' future if they want a successful rebuild, and absolutely has star potential. So you think getting him the ball more and furthering his development would be a priority for the Bulls' coaching staff, right? Jim Boylan's plans say otherwise. I've already mentioned how Boylan's substitutions are to the detriment of Markkinen's development, but his growth is stunted even more so with how he's actually used in game. Despite having one of the best face-up games from the mid-post of all young players in the league, Boylan apparently doesn't care for that. He instead relegated Lowry's role on offense to basically being a spot-up three-point shooter. This wasn't the case for Markkinen's first two seasons, where he averaged nearly 70 touches and 2.4 post-ups a game. In the 2020 season, however, his touches had fallen to 45 a game and post-ups to only one. As this severely reduced role on offense happened to coincide with the progression of production in nearly every statistical category for Markkinen, he clearly, and very justifiably, wasn't happy with how he was being used on offense. When he aired these complaints to Boylan, Jimbo's response to Larry was for him to concentrate on defensive rebounds if you want more touches. Now, Larry definitely didn't like that response because, for some reason, he apparently couldn't see the viability in averaging an extra 40 defensive rebounds a game to make up for his lost touches. Hey coach, I think I deserve more touches. All right, this interview is finished. <laughs> I'm sure if I tried, I could probably drone on about this idiot for hours on end. So for the sake of time, I'll try to sum up his remaining issues in an all encompassing section here. For one thing, he's not great with the media. Why is he out of the rotation? Uh, because I said so. 
I don't need to tell you that answering a legitimate question about his rotations with Because I said so Isn't exactly a great response Such a response offers zero insight or further understanding to the reporter asking the question But more importantly, it kind of makes you look like an idiot that can't justify your own actions And when the NBA world has already come to the near unanimous consensus that you're a terrible coach who doesn't know what he's doing Looking like an idiot is something you should maybe try avoiding Furthermore, Jimbo just can't seem to find the right voice in how he presents himself to his team he just doesn't pick his moments right. On the one hand, he likes to show himself as his big, loud, hard-nosed, no bullshit coach that loves shouting and doesn't take shit from anyone. Obviously, he's trying his damn hardest to copy his former mentor, Greg Popovich. Unfortunately for Jimbo, there's a somewhat major difference between him and Pop. While Pop's coaching style has led to actual tangible success, a lot of it in fact, Boylan's coaching methods have only led to the opposite of success. Something that only exacerbates the problem is when Boylan decides to react very softly in the wake of a loss. That whole gritty, tough, rigid persona that Jimbo is always pushing suddenly looks a lot more like overly dramatic acting that's all fluff with no substance. If he isn't reacting strongly in the wake of defeat, particularly when a lot of the time it's to some of the worst teams in the league, this makes him look like he doesn't even care about winning to his team. For example, a few weeks into the 2020 season, only two months removed after proudly stating the playoffs as a goal for the Bulls this season, after a 14 point loss to the league worst Golden State Warriors, Jimbo simply said there's no shame in losing to such a team. Yep, no shame at all in losing to a G League team led by a washed up Draymond Green when you're meant to be a playoff contender. This apparent lack of concern for winning is something Boylan has demonstrated across his entire tenure as head coach. He always says something along the lines of winning isn't his main focus, but rather thinks the most important focus is developing consistency or some fucking bullshit. Coaching with such an indifference to winning isn't exactly going to instill a winning mentality in the team's players, and obviously hasn't. However, despite everything I've mentioned to this point, there is one example in particular that, more than anything else, perfectly showcases Boylan's delusional mindset and his lack of attachment to reality. It is the cream of the crop, if you will, of things I could show you to demonstrate Jimbo's irrefutable and apodictic incompetence. The example I'm of course talking about is when he said to the media that one of the goals for his team is to average 35 assists per game. Now, 25 assists would have been an actual realistic goal, but to say 35 is just pure lunacy. The highest amount of assists average per game in NBA history is only 31.4, and this was done by the 1985 LA Lakers. This was a team led by a prime Magic Johnson, had five Hall of Famers and won the championship. The only team since these Lakers to average even at least 30 assists a game is the 2017 Golden State Warriors, potentially the greatest team in history. Jim Boylan apparently thinks that this Bulls team has the same capacity to be in the same offensive calibre as these all-time great teams. It's all well and good to strive towards a lofty ambition, but fuck me Jim. To say you can see this team here set the highest assist per game record in the entire history of the NBA is complete fucking idiocy. Jim Boylan, you are a clown buddy! For over 10 years, a rot had infested the Chicago Bulls front office. That rot was called Garpax. With Gar Foreman as the Bulls general manager and John Paxson as vice president of basketball operations, these two matched up perfectly for each other as they worked tirelessly day in and day out to make sure the Bulls never won another championship. They've literally been responsible for over a decade of bad decision making and really need their own separate video if I went into any more detail. But I'm sure you don't need much more of an indication of their front office capabilities when they are the ones responsible for hiring Jim Boylan as head coach in the first place. And then, instead of firing him for being completely shit at his job, they gave him a multi-year contract extension. But in any case, Bulls owner Jerry Reinsdorf, somebody who has shown a knack for supporting GMs that make decisions detrimental to the team in the past, finally grew something resembling a backbone and fired Foreman from his GM position, whilst also removing John Paxson from his role as VP of Basketball Operations. The long-lasting rot in the Bulls organisation was being cleared at last. However, there is still one individual in particular that hasn't gone just yet. As of July 2020, Jim Boylan's tenuous reign as the Chicago Bulls head coach continues on. However, it certainly appears that his demise is looming just over the horizon, and at this point, is inevitable. Given the many reasons for Jim Boylan sucking ass at his job that I have so eloquently laid out in this video, I, and the vast, vast majority of NBA fans, consider him a goner. With Gar Pax now finally gone, and Mr. K... Knisivis, now running the Bulls front office, at some point in the upcoming months, I definitely anticipate Boylan to be fired. 
It's never a nice thing to root for a hard-working individual to lose their job, but unfortunately for Jimbo, he just really brought it upon himself. When nearly everybody in the world that follows your business believes you're bad at your job, that's generally a sign that you might need to spruce things up a bit and change your ways if you don't want to get the sack. In Jimbo's case, he decided to do the opposite. He buckled down, blocked out the haters, and further entrenched himself in his ways, despite their lack of success. That first week in the job certainly wasn't a positive sign for good things to come. I mean, he went 1-4, and four, coached over the worst loss in Chicago Bulls history, and nearly caused a team mutiny from his practices. It's almost like he was trying to get fired. But you know, in fairness to Boylan, he wasn't exactly in a very ideal situation. He was effectively thrust into a team riddled with injuries and asked to make things work. And it's not like the team was killing or anything before he became head coach. They were 5-19 in the season prior to his coaching promotion. And although he may have slightly, quite severely stunted Larry Markman's growth, Zach Levine at least has blossomed under his coaching, going from a good young player with potential to basically a star level player with all NBA potential. More than anything however, getting his players to put in greater effort on the defensive end has been Jimbo's main contribution to this team. The Bulls defense ranked 13th in the league for the 2020 season, which although not exactly elite, is much more than anybody realistically expected of them given their youth and injuries, and is a massive improvement from being ranked third last in the league just two seasons prior. In fact, for the month of December in 2019, the Bulls defense ranked as number two in the entire league and was receiving praise from Eric Spolstra. They're well coached. Uh, they're, they've, they've been committed to their defense you know, all year long and, and they're just uniquely disruptive. At the very least, Jim Boylan is a man that always tried and worked hard at his job. It's just that his efforts may have been somewhat misguided at times. And hey, if anything, he got Garpax fired. So there's always that. Maybe he wasn't so bad after all. Nah, he sucks. Jim is gone. He's gone. I miss him so much. <laughs> oh, I cry myself to sleep, Jim. <laughs> False. I do not miss him.